fine. Okay, good. All right. Oh, nice. <laughs> Welcome, Me everybody. Dreaming. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I am chatting. I'm Annalie Huber, and I am chatting with Ashley Weaver and Rachel McMillan, my fellow author friends. Um, we're so excited for you guys to join us. So um, if you have any questions while we're chatting, um, just pop them into the comments and we will check in every once in a while and, and uh, see what you guys want to hear and what, what you want to know. So um, anyway, hi, ladies. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Good. <laughs> nice to get this. We did one. Was it last summer or end yeah. of summer? I think it was in like September, right? Or October? Somewhere I think so, there. around then. Yeah. yeah. Which was so much fun, but we're like, we have to do this again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Get the band so. back together because we do talk on Twitter in Twitter DMs. Twitter can be a good thing. It's not all doom and gloom and people angry at the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to do the side chats too, because, you know, it's just, it's just us. So we could say whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So one thing I wanted to talk about, because we kind of have been chatting about this in a side chat, is about fictional crushes. <laughs> because, Rachel, we've we've heard a lot about Simon this year. <laughs> I love Simon. I actually, because Simon is still evolving, um, we heard a lot about him. I do remember talking about him in the last time we met. Um, Simon is the hero of the Mozart Code, which is my next release, but he also features in the London Restoration, uh, which came out last year, and he has a very enigmatic role in that, in that he's kind of my heroine's MI6 handler, but you kind of get the background of why Simon is the way he is in the Mozart Code. So which Simon is he's just I love him he's so I can't great. wait to read the Mozart code because I'm really excited <laughs> as soon as Simon walked on the page I was like who is this guy like I was like seriously there's something about him that was like he's oh, got she has to write about him <laughs> so he sat down there's a there's a scene where Diana my heroine of London Restoration meets him in the Savoy and they haven't seen each other in a while and he was with her at Bletchley Park he was kind of the overseer of her group of code breakers and he sits down and at this point in my head he'd been like a plot device I needed somebody to like lure Diana into working in this spy world when she's back in London after the war and as soon as he sat down I had his entire backstory oh that's so awesome I, yeah. I just kind of just the way he sat I was like oh I know just kind of walked now. into your world yeah <laughs> and that come. is the scene that's the scene where you're like Ooh, like who are you I'm getting my post-it out I've got to come up with a great heroine for him and I do I think she's wonderful but basically <clears throat> if you take Brideshead Revisited and the imitation game and Amadeus and mush them together then you get Mozart codes <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'm um, well, and then we've got to talk about Gordon, or not Gordon, <laughs> my gosh, Major Ramsey from, <laughs> from uh, Ashley's new Who's book giving Milo out. a run for his money in a completely different way. He's so <laughs> different for you, Ashley. He's very different. I thought it would be really fun to kind of have somebody who was opposite of Milo, but I didn't go into it thinking like, I need this guy to be the polar opposite of Milo. You know, I just knew, he, of course, he's going to be more regimented and stern and since he's in the military. But um, once I started writing him, he was kind of, he, he, he just kind of developed like pretty naturally. And I was like, oh, he's so different than Milo, but I, I like him a lot. I think he's a lot of fun in his own way. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yes. I, I mean, readers are going to love it. And this is, we're talking about her new book that's coming out May 25th called um, A Pe Peculiar Combination. It's her new series. So the can cover you- The cover is amazing. Yes. Can I'm you so get- excited when I saw the cover. Can you give readers just a brief- it like overview like just so they know what we're talking about <laughs> oh about the book yes. yeah sure um it's set in uh, 1940 london and my heroine is named electra mcdonald but she just she goes by ellie everyone calls her ellie and she belongs to a family of locksmiths slash safe crackers and so they kind of supplement their income with little robberies here and there but um one night they're set up and they get uh arrested sort of but it's not the police. They're pulled into um, military intelligence who ends up giving them the choice between working for them to get some papers from a safe before they can be handed over to the Nazis or they can go to jail. So of course they want to do their patriotic duty as well as not go to jail. 
<laughs> win win. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's such a cool thing because it's a side of London we don't usually see, especially not in historical fiction. Like it very much is a World War II novel, like every other novel written right now. Right. <laughs> World War II. But you set London during the Blitz so amazingly because we get the beauty of the city, but also the fact that it's, they're in a very precarious position, mm -hmm. not just because of what they're doing for intelligence, but because the bombs are falling. It's just, it's also, it's amazing. And if you're a romantic, the immediacy wow. of the danger that they're always facing, just, it's, it's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I, I got the um, idea. I think maybe I mentioned this, I think last time we talked, but I read a book, uh, nonfiction book called Agent Zigzag by Ben McIntyre. And it was about a World War II double agent. He was actually kind of like a petty criminal or whatever. And he got arrested in the, on the, cha in the Channel Islands. And so when they were occupied by the Germans, the Germans said, we'll let you out of prison if you spy for us. So he said, okay. And they took him, trained him, parachuted him back into London. And he went right to the authorities and said, the Germans sent me, do you want me to spy on them for you? And so it's a really, it's an awesome book. Actually, everything I've read by Ben McIntyre is ben spectacular. Ben amazing. Yes, he really so is. good. But um, so that was kind of, I was like, oh, that's an interesting kind of, um, you know, look, you don't see, uh, aspect you don't see too often is the sort of the idea of, you know, you're so banded together as a country that even people who normally are criminals or kind of on the wrong side of the law are still wanting to do their part. So I thought that would be sort of a fun idea. And I kind of took that and ran with it. And I love that you gender flipped it so that it is Electra, which mm -hmm. is name, but Ellie, who is this person. And yes, she comes from this band of this family that's maybe a little bit like underhanded in what they do, but they're thieves with hearts of gold. Like I'm rooting right. <laughs> all of them. Like they're so protective of each other. And ugh, I love that. But I think you've done a good job. I know there's a lot of backstory coming for both of your two main characters. So it's mm -hmm. like, we're all pulled in and like, we want to know in the next book, like, okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And yeah. it, it has a cozy feel like the, like Amory and Milo Ames series, even though it's set during the Blitz in this explosive world, it still has a very cozy feel to it I think yeah, it's I didn't want to get too dark with it I think maybe I just like naturally don't tend to write dark maybe and especially when I'm writing in first person kind of you know um she's got sort of a spunky like sort of sarcastic personality so she never too much dwells on the dark side of things I guess did you get to yeah. try safe cracking we want to know that I bought a lock picking kit and <laughs> like you could just buy them online and so I bought you know locksmiths or whatever and so I, I played around with it I didn't get really good at it I was like I'm gonna master this and be you know a, a safe <laughs> cracker <laughs> but um I never really mastered it but I did I did enjoy you know getting to try a little hands-on and mostly what I did was I read a lot of articles and how-tos and then I kind of had to put it all together and then find a way to sort of integrate it without being too much like a manual or something. You know, I was, I was, I kept every once in a while I would think of Charlize Theron from the Italian job because she's oh, a yeah. safe cracker. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shelly wants to know how you came up with the name Electra. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. You know, I don't remember. I, uh, I, I did it for the National Novel Writing Month in 2018 was when I first wrote the book. And so um, either that or 2017, one of the two, but I, I wrote it and I, I think I just kind of, it was just a sort of a name that came to me. It was kind of like with Amory, like I sort of like knew her name from the beginning that was sort of, you know, in my head. And I like kind of, it kind of works with, um, Ellie does mention, but it's kind of a spoiler in the book, sort of a reason why she thinks she was named Electra. So that kind of ties into Right. Yeah, but I can't. You know, <laughs> are you guys like I am in that, like, your characters won't work until you have the right name for yes. them? Yes. Yeah. Especially your main characters. It's like mm -hmm. you're like, you can't really fully form them until you've got it. Got, I don't know. Yeah. It's even like <laughs> kind of like you have a picture of them, but you need that like exact name for like it, the pieces to cl all click into place. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's hard with my Simon because through London Restoration, he's known as Simon Barr. 
but his actual name is Simon Barrington. So he introduced himself to me as Barrington. And so throughout London Restoration, I'd be typing Bar and I was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a spoiler at this point because it's on the back cover copy, which is still evolving. As back cover copy does, readers, I mean, yeah. often we write the cover copy and it goes out before the book is finished. So then yes. you look back and it's oh, like, yeah. it's not really and I have to be like, wait a minute, that's not really what happens. <laughs> Oh, scratch that. Um, but that was interesting because he is Bar he's Simon Barrington to me, but I had to keep correcting myself. So that's funny. You know, and I find names so, so important. Um, mm -hmm. They just like Ver Verity. Hmm. I love yeah, that talk name. About I know. a little bit about how you came up with yours. Yeah, Verity. I, I get asked this all the time and I don't remember. Um, <laughs> Actually, I think maybe, I was realizing this the other day, um, my favorite Susanna Kearsley book is um, All of the Shadowy Horses. Is that right? Oh, yeah, that's a anyway, good Anyway, I just love that one. And yeah. I realized the heroine's name Verity. And I'm like, I must have read that like years ago when I first read it and just filed that name away because I was like, this is a great name. Yeah. And then totally forgot that's where I got it from because I can't think of how else I would have stumbled across it. Um, but yeah, I was just like, oh, it's perfect because it means truth, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then Kent just came, I don't know, I just fit. So <laughs> just, that's a British yeah. name. it really suits because um, there is something pragmatic about her. And that actually is interesting because Kiara, Kiara is a gorgeous name too, right? And yeah, Kiara's mystery is the most recent one. And readers, if you haven't read it yet, it is, I actually thought last year's book of yours was the perfect pandemic read, uh, the 12, it was 12th Night Story. A stroke of Malice, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stroke of Malice, night. sorry for blanking on the title. I remember the plots, but- You're better. fine, you're fine. <laughs> um, because it's, you know, set in this manor house and it's all kind of cloistered, but there are scenes in the new one where it's in Scotland, there's a pandemic, there's Bonnie Brock who's back. <laughs> We find, you know, Kiara and Sebastian, Sebastian, and <laughs> there are moments that are very, like, closed off from the world. If you're a claustrophobic reader in that you just really sense the world closing in, I found that a lot. So, Anna, like, did you find that your writing was influenced by, obviously, you had the pandemic thing before Right. You would have had that plotted before COVID because. Correct. I was in the middle of the writing term. it. Yeah. I was in the middle of writing a wicked conceit when we all locked down basically. And so it definitely changed the book because for one, I had to make sure, like I had to put a thing at the beginning because I knew people were never going to believe this is what they did in the past when this is what we do now. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, plus I actually backed off like the cholera epidemic was supposed to be much more of a strong presence in the book. And I was like, I can't do this because people are going to be so like tired of the pandemic by the time they read this, like they'll hate it, you know? So oh, yeah. I like I actually the pandemic was going to be two weeks and now it's yeah. like 15 months long. Yeah. <laughs> I was glad that I had thought that far enough ahead to think, I don't think I want to make this such a big presence. So it's there, but it's like, this ominous thing that's in the background of everything, you know what I mean? But it's not, you know, because for those people who are really sick of the pandemic, <laughs> you know what I mean? so, everyone. because I, we're all sick of it, we're all sick of it, you know, so. Here's yeah. the flag again, but with yeah. different characters. No, but it, it really does add to the tension, you know, obviously at this point in the series, Kiara is pregnant, she's about to have her baby. Yes, she's ready to pop. <laughs> Baskin is super overprotective, but I think that what I found really interesting is it gives an almost hopeful look to, yes, we're going through a pandemic and it's terrible. Um, Toronto, where I live, just got the gold medal for being the longest lockdown city in the world. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. To earn that title. Go us. Um, but Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> reading, reading your book made me realize that, yes, it's pandemics are horrible. Epidemics are horrible. There's death. There's sickness. But 
gosh, it would have sucked so much more to live <laughs> through it back then. Right. What well, they had to go through versus what we're doing, like, oh, right. Zoom call, order Uber Eats. It's it's just a little bit different. Well, I mean, I mean, for me, it gave me hope too because, like, we've been through stuff before, like that. Yeah, we will get through this. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I mean, even knowing, okay, now we know cholera, we just boil the water <laughs> right. and get better sanitation and we're fine. But you want to go back to care and say, like, know that. Yeah. and so, yeah, <laughs> which is crazy. But so, okay, Cindy asks, uh, yes, Verity is a character on Poldark, but I started writing oh, the Verity yeah. Kent series before I had ever oh, seen Oh, I forgot Poldark. about that. So oh, I, I knew it couldn't have been Poldark. that that inspired it. Um, Let's see. Also, okay, Rachel asks, on a scale of from one to 10, how wrong is it to crush on Bonnie Brock? <laughs> no, I actually think that's legit, <laughs> Rachel. I think we're all kind There's of- There's a lot of people that do, so I'm fine with it. <laughs> he is kind of a, he's, he's a okay, rascal. I mean, he's dangerous, but oh yeah, I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> a lot of you guys commenting on crushes that's awesome so <laughs> oh I love that I don't have to go back and look and see who other yeah. people's crushes are <laughs> I know what about you all what are some like other fictional crushes I was like trying to think back on um like other books I've read that I've had crushes on like the characters you know um like I gotta say Brisbane from yes definitely. Oh, oh, gosh. Gosh. yeah the lady Julia Stoker, Stoker too though but her city, Deanna Rayborn, her city of Jasmine and Night of a Thousand Stars, both of them have amazing heroes, like amazing heroes. I am hardcore Ian Graham from Kate Quinn's The Huntress. Um, he's one of my husbands, um, <laughs> my fictional husbands. I crush so hard. Um, Ashley, you know that Milo and I have a very special relationship. Oh, right? yes, Milo. <laughs> yes. And Anna, I love Sebastian Gage. I do. But there's <laughs> something about Sydney Kent. <laughs> I, He's a bit more of a of a bad boy. In some he ways. is, and his car keeps getting wrecked. And <laughs> now I've heard Rachel say before that she's not really um, a bad boy type of girl, but these crushes. I, I, I can burn. I can <laughs> depending on the. I, I have trouble. I think I, it's because I have, I, I, I am writing a bit of a rascal right now for an upcoming novel, but um, I have trouble writing the bad boy, but I do tend to write the guy who's not the conventionally handsome guy, like uh, Brent Somerville in London Restoration is, you know, all he has to be is attractive to the heroine. Right, right. right. So he's not, you know, he's a theology professor and that kind of thing. But I would say Simon is my the first time I've written like a super conventional Paul Dark and Handsome. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love writing their reverent like guys who rogues. I don't they're just fun. I mean Bonnie Brock and Marsdale and um Alec Xavier from Parody Cat and I mean all of them they're just they're fun because you can make them say whatever. They can say what you would never say. You know what right. I mean? Like, <laughs> or even maybe what your heroine would never say. Or right. you know, I um just finished turned it in Monday, the second book in this um the Electra series, and wow. uh, I've got some really like kind of kooky characters that are you know friends of you know theirs from the criminal underworld and stuff who popped up in this one that I had a lot of fun with. You always <laughs> because, what is the um. What is the Milo and Amory where they, this is something I remember from last year. I don't know how to say, I say Amory and that's not how you, this is something I remember. We did say Amory, but it doesn't really matter. (laughs) Um, But what is the book where they go to New York? Uh, uh, Dangerous Engagement. Because you had a really awesome club owner who was oh uh, my gangster i, I yeah, liked him yeah. i liked you know, him fun fact the very first not full-length novel i ever wrote i started uh, my freshman year of high school and it was i call it a um gangster mystery romance and it was set in prohibition era chicago and it was about um a girl whose uh boyfriend was uh in with the mob and he was convicted uh gonna go to the electric chair for a crime he didn't commit so she had to like go to the um the mob boss to get help 
you know, to prove his innocence and stuff. And so I would like write a few pages and bring it and my friends would read it at the lunch table <laughs> at school. And so kind of that one gave me a chance. I was like, I've got to get my gangster guys in here. <laughs> I'm totally writing 1920s though, Ashley. You'd, you'd rock the prohibition era mystery. I've always like States. been so interested in that era. So maybe one day. Oh, yeah. I was looking when I wrote that Dangerous Engagement, it was just the tail end. Like there was a couple months left of prohibition by the time Amory and Milo made it to New York. And I was like, I can still sneak it in. <laughs> oh, you did. I, I love that one. But, so, yeah. Ra Rachel, tell me, um, Vienna, you love Vienna. You have love a love Vienna. affair with Vienna. Yeah. You get to write about Vienna. I know. I know. It's so exciting. So I, I do do these little um, contemporary romances set in Vienna that I just do on my own. Basically, I call them my hobby, but I let people peer over my shoulder. <laughs> I do indie publish them. Luckily, my publisher, HarperCollins, is amazing. And the, they like include them in my books, which is so Oh, nice. that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's yeah. Um, but this time I did get to um, write Vienna in a contracted traditional historical novel and it plays a major part and ever since I was a kid I was fascinated by the fact that Mozart's death mask turned up after the war in a pawn shop in Vienna in 1940 oh. and I thought this is so cool. I'm really into the fact that the bombs were terrible in Europe, in London and in Vienna, in Prague, but they exhumed these amazing artifacts that people thought had been lost. Oh, wow. And so there's a bunch of like, we're not sure if it's actually Mozart's death mask that was found. There's two, you know, battling theories about it but I've had that in the back of my head forever. And I knew that I wanted to try and pull Vienna into this world. Um, London Restoration and Mozart Code are, they're kind of a duology, but they're different plots, but they have overlapping characters. So you can read one or both, but I knew that it would be amazing to tie in Vienna in the post-war because, um, you know, Vienna almost fell behind the Iron Curtain. It came this close. So because I love artifacts and history and classical music, and it's such a part of London Restoration, I thought, oh my gosh, I can tie in Mozart's Death Mask. And perfect. It, it's That's so, awesome. Yeah. So you get to see a different kind of Vienna. Now, when you go to Vienna, um, you know, the, the Marshall Plan from the States, uh, that really helped to rebuild the city after the war and help them get it back to its beautiful state from the bombs etc but you get a vienna that's beautiful because it's so historic but also has undergone treachery so it's it's a really interesting canvas and everything in the world in world war ii is set in paris so i thought it would hopefully i love it paris, i love that you're doing vienna Vienna and Prague. So it's kind awesome. of Vienna is Simon's world and his heroine is Sophie and her world is Prague. And you get to see both of these cool cities. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited. Both. So Mozart's a huge part of the world. But yeah. I love those cities and I love this artifact. I mean, I'm just, this is all my jam. So yeah, it sounds amazing. <laughs> I'm more excited now. Um, even more excited. Um, um, Ashley, uh, Olive wants to know: Will you be also con will you also be continuing the Amory Ames series? The Amory Ames series. Yes, Ashley, tell us. Well, the second book that in the Electra series I just finished is uh, the last book of my contract, so I'm going to kind of see what happens next, and um, hopefully, uh, I've got more ideas for Amory <laughs> Milo in the future. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I um, sometimes just say that Ashley should write them and just send them to me. Like if she yeah. is Milo, then just be like, okay, just email me that because write fan fiction of myself. <laughs> I, would, I would watch Milo like fishing, not that Milo would go fishing, but if he did. Oh my gosh, Milo fishing. <laughs> I want to see you guys do an overlapping. <laughs> that would be fun. We've talked about this before. We have, we've talked about it. It's like one of these days. <laughs> somebody's going to pop up in somebody's book. <laughs> So Shelly says, 
Oh, thank you. I'm not going to read all the comments that don't have questions, but if people want to read them, they can. Thank you, Shelly. I'm glad you guys were swooning over Gage. <laughs> yes, um, Gage. Uh, they, people can't wait to get y'all's books. I can say that. Um, oh, thank you. Um, thank you. I'm glad you liked it. We can see. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So they're just comments. I'm loving all the comments though. We'll oh, I'm gonna go back, back and read, and read later. them when we're done. So yes, for sure. <laughs> Lots of gushing. So that's that's awesome. So. Who's playing Gage in a movie? Because I spend a lot of my life figuring out. <laughs> So when I first Poldark. what's the Poldark actor's name? That is my Aiden sister. Turner. Yes, but like in that's he's character. kind of like so he is my Sydney, but it's when he's playing, he's kind of my Sydney. Yes, um, I think we talked about that. Yes, because we have um, you have Milo, and then there uh, were none. Uh what's the Agatha Christie? And then, and then there, there were none. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Man. There's like the way he, he looks recycled in that, that he's sitting in the tuxedo drinking that, you know, yes, the, um, yes. I think it's very kind of like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Here's we're both like, okay, okay, I guess we're inspired by this. <laughs> when, you but know, Gage, Ver sorry, oh, sorry, but no, Verity ahead. wakes up, okay, Verity sleeping next to Sydney when she wakes up and there's, I think there's one scene where she's just watching him and his hair has kind of, yeah. In the new book, yes. <laughs> it's so swoony. Like, oh, Verity, I'm with you. It's, it's <laughs> I love it too because perfection. <laughs> Kira is is much more um, circumspect. I don't know, you know, shy, yeah. whatever you want to say. Not really shy, but you know what I mean? But Verity is definitely like a woman. She's been a spy. I mean, she's been, you know, <laughs> I mean, in, behind me. enemy lines, basically. So, I mean, she's much more... Uh, and the time go difference, for it. I think, makes a different a, a difference too. Yeah. Their their eras. Yes. So they live yeah. In. So the scenes are fun. Yeah. She's definitely yeah. She's not afraid to ogle her husband. Yeah. <laughs> no. And I mean, even Max in the first book, like Max is set up. I I want Max to find a love and happiness because I would marry him too. Uh, but so you were saying something about Gage and I got sidetracked. Oh, you're fine. No, you were asking who would play him. When I first started writing him, um, in my mind, I had Rupert Henry Jones from um, when he plays Captain Wentworth in Persuasion. Oh, yeah. Um, kind of mixed in with like Simon Baker from The Mentalist. Like it's kind oh, of a conglomeration. Um, but they're both too old now. <laughs> like, um, but Simon Baker would be an awesome Lord Gage. I mean, um, Gage's father. So I don't really know who would play Gage. There's an edge Gage. there, too. Huh? There's an edge, too. Yes. I, I love that. Yeah. So I don't really know for Gage. I mean, um, it's hard now. I don't know. And, you know, I'm kind of okay with it. Because if it ever did get it, I mean, it's not like you're going to get your pick anyway. Right. So. <laughs> Don't pin your hopes on anybody in particular. I mean, it, I, I mean, a lot of times they'll find somebody that you don't even know and it'll end up being way bad, better anyway than you could have mm -hmm. imagined. So, I mean, think about the other shows that that's happened. So anyway. It's really cool when, because I think casting is amazing. I think whoever has the, the ability to see potential. I, I was thinking of this today, I guess, because he has a new film out, but whoever saw Benedict Cumberbatch and was like, Sherlock Holmes, like, Nobody right. I remember first hearing that and was like, no. And then he's he's brilliant. He's perfect. So oh yay. Uh I'm like going through trying to see if there's questions. Lots of great comments. Um, oh hey, Ashley and Rachel, I'm not familiar with you. What books of yours do you recommend? What do you what do you, what should they start with? Uh the first book in my Amory Aim series is Murder at the Brightwell. Um, there are seven books in that series, and then uh, the first book in my new series is out May 25th. So, if you want to get a head start, you can start with Murder at the Brightwell. And I, I love, honestly, readers, I, I reread their series a lot. Like, I'm a, I'm a compulsive rereader. I'll just go back to favorite scenes. Um, for my books, honestly, I would, because I'm so in love with Simon and he's kind of my whole world right now, I really, <laughs> like, London, I really like London Restoration. Um, it's a historical romance that starts usually where the film would end 
where the hero and heroine have been separated for four years and they're married, but then they went to war and then they have to find true love again amidst a okay. ball London. And I just, I, I love those characters and how romantic it is. So and Rachel's settings are just brilliant. That's why I cannot wait for um, Mozart Code because I know Beyond Vienna and Prague are going to be amazing. Yeah. Because her London is just in the churches. And I mean, it's just like, you want to sink your teeth into it. It's just so good. Like the it's like you're there. You can picture everything. Yes. It's good. I it's really love good. writing settings. Um, but yeah. But I, uh, Ashley, who would pay, play Ramsey? Sorry. I'm like back in hot guy land. Oh, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think readers Everybody, mind. Read my books. Now back to the men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. You know, I was thinking about that too. And I was like, I need someone kind of, he's a little bit like taller and bigger. And um, I was like, who would be like someone tall and good looking in a uniform? And I thought maybe like um, Sam Hewen. Yeah. Who's that? Sorry. From Outlander. From Outlander. I haven't oh, seen Outlander, but okay. he's got that kind of brawny physique, you know? I don't know. But I was like, I don't know. It's hard sometimes because no one's ever going to be just how you picture them in your head. They right. show up so clearly. And it's funny, I haven't seen Miss Scarlet and the Duke yet because I am waiting for, sometimes I watch these series when I go visit my parents. So that's one of them I'm saving for when I go home um, to visit them. But I have described it as what I think Miss Scarlet and the Duke is, which is this really feisty, wonderful woman who has this very... Uh, patient man who, yeah. <laughs> you know, who has his own skill set. And Anna, I have talked to you about this a lot, how what I love about both of your heroes, Sydney and Gage, is that they both have to learn how to take a step back so that their heroines can flourish. And they're both products of time periods and backgrounds where that's really hard. I mean, you don't get anachronistic. They're still very much within the lines of tradition and history. But Gage and then Sydney, who obviously is from a noble family with very idealized lines of what a man's role should be, that's partly where the romance comes from. And Milo has that too, Milo just takes a little bit longer to get <laughs> to get around because we've got seven books of Milo. Not sure what he's doing, but when <laughs> right. it's good and it's good and wonderful, it's more heartwarming. You know the monkey he gives yeah. a monkey. I do love that monkey. <laughs> which would not work in any other book by any other author. <laughs> Like, if it's not Milo, a character showing up after an argument with a monkey would just, the readers would be like, Ugh. but it's Milo. So of course that's where he went. <laughs> that, I was writing that scene and I prepared, I might've told you guys just before, but I was writing that scene and he had gone and he was gone all night and he came back in the morning and they were, I was prepared to write like this tense um, argument scene. And then like, I was just writing and he's like, and he brought her a monkey. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that surprised me too. <laughs> You hear authors say stuff like it just happened and you're like sure but like I did not expect that to happen at all and I just wrote it and I was like well I guess I have a monkey now <laughs> and I you know I still have it so you, fun you know I that's so funny that you you were mentioning all this about the heroes and stuff and the way they are because I was I for some reason I've been thinking a lot about it lately and I've been thinking about the fact that um a big part of my hero's appeal is like they said they they learn it's a process but they listen mm -hmm. to their heroines when their heroines really needed someone to listen like that's part of the reason they love them because they live in a world where the men don't listen and they've been so right. you know their lives and they actually have this man who listens to them and i was and also thinking their, about the fact that values their skill sets yeah. too. yes and that they're I was thinking about the fact that a good guy can still be a hot guy. You know what I mean? Like too right. often it's like, oh, it's the bad boy. You know, it's like, no, a good guy can still be a hot guy. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, they're that, not mutually exclusive. We right. can convince as writers, any reader 
that our hero is, I mean, uh, what I love about your books, and I try to do the same thing, is that the physical is very much a part of the romance, but the more you read, it becomes lesser to every other um, uh, value system and trait. Right. Care. I mean, Gage goes from like, yeah, she notices him in a room to he is the opposite of Kiara Darby. And you learn this in, oh my gosh, you're doing a book club so we can all read it again. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. I, I am a good old Lady Darby read along. <laughs> so I'm going through the whole series. If you want to join in, it's on my page. You can yes, find it, so. you meet Gage and you're like <laughs> the opposite of Lady Darby's first husband who is the spawn of Satan. And <laughs> So at first it's like, okay, well, a dirty sock could show up and there's progress, <laughs> but <laughs> it's Gage. And the more you fall in love with Gage, it's that wonderful, and you do this too, Ashley, it's that wonderful balance of the male being a protective figure, but still allowing the heroine to be able to save herself in moments. Yes. And that's yes. a serious balance because readers, especially romance readers, want that moment where and I think um I'm gonna do a bad paraphrase but I always think of Elizabeth Peters um who said that no woman actually wants a man to carry her off pick her up and carry her off she just wants him to want to do it and so we get these heroes who definitely want to protect and save the heroine and have that moment but also know okay wait a second if this is not life-threatening danger and she can handle herself, I can give leeway for this to happen. And I am confident enough in myself that I can step back. And I think that's awesome. I mean, it's sexy. My love, my love. Yeah. <laughs> so Andy wants to know what, sorry, my, oh yeah. Andy wants to know what books are you reading and enjoying? Well, I can go on and on. <laughs> I'm reading um, All of Bright Pigeoneer by uh, oh, Sophia I love right that now. Book. It's so good. I'm really it's loving so it. So good. The pigeons. Um, I'm going for titles here, guys, because I have to tell you, I remember I'm, I'm bad at titles. So I recently finished um, the new Will Thomas book, mm. uh, <laughs> Death, Victorian Era. Sorry, I'm actually on my Instagram. Oh, um, <laughs> I just read the new Mary, Maggie Hope book. Um, oh, book. yeah. Oh, I read it too. It was so good. Isn't it fantastic? Yes, so good. I loved it because it. She Maggie is no longer in Britain in the Blitz. She's in Hollywood this time. And I never knew that there was that connection. I always learned so much from her books. And then another one. Susan's that I, awesome. She's amazing. We should do one of these with her. Yes. I thought about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I read a cont I also I read every genre, so I I love everything. But I read Very Sincerely Yours by Carrie Winfrey, which comes mm. out soon, and it's a contemporary romance where the hero is basically like a modern day Mister Rogers. He's like hot Mister Rogers, and he's a children's show host. Oh, fun! Aww. He ends up striking up an email correspondence with our heroine, so it's like you've got mail meets Mister Rogers. Oh, and I love uh, it charming and then I should shout out to um Patty Callahan she wrote Becoming Mrs. Lewis she's written prolific yes um she has a book coming out in October that I'm just reading now called Once Upon a Wardrobe and it's set in the 1950s and it has a very interesting kind of Narnia type nostalgia to oh. it so I'm reading A Dream of Death which is um, the first Kate Hamilton mystery by Connie Berry. And I'm loving it. It's set Ooh. in, um, it's contemporary, but it's set in the Scottish Highlands on this island. And um, there's like a historical aspect to it because there's like a murder that happens contemporarily and it's like echoing a historical murder. So it's really good. I'm loving it. It's the first in a series. So I may end up gobbling the whole series up. Um, and then I actually, I'm also reading this book called Dark Archives. It's by Megan Rosenblum, and it's nonfiction. Um, Sarah Wendell from, um, or Wendell, I may say that wrong, um, from Smart um, Podcast Trashy Books. Um, she you recommended this You're to so me. Famous. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. Anyway, she recommended this to me when she interviewed me for the podcast, and 
it's absolutely fascinating. It's this team of um, researchers who, like I knew about um, Burke, um, that they made a book from his skin. Okay, like they, they yeah. covered it with the skin. It's in the Surgeon's Hall Museum in um, Edinburgh. And I, we saw it when we were there. And but you I did not realize this was actually a thing. Like in the 19th century, like doctors would like cover books like with skin. human skin, like <laughs> as the leather covering, okay? And anyway, they're like researching, they're going through these libraries, like trying to figure out like some of the books do, that say they are, are actually skin. Some of them are not. Some of the books that they didn't know were skin are human skin. And it's just like, oh, oh I'm ordering that. <laughs> it's just, it's fascinating. And I mean, like, it's so well, it's just great. It's great. It's just researchers, but it's so interesting. So if you like that kind of stuff, <laughs> I was like, I'm ordering it, and Rachel's like, <laughs> no, but you, you do mention, do you mention it in, or did I just Wikipedia after one of the Lady Darbies? Because I, 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 I think I mentioned it in like an uh, author note about Burke. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, let's see. Okay, Shelly, when do you read each other's books before they are published? <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> we're lucky and we get ours. Yes. So like. We were lucky enough to get an arc of um, Ashley's new yes. book. Um, and yeah, so it, it just depends. Yeah, like kind of, Rachel a lot of get times gets arcs of mine. And <laughs> yeah, and I uh, we got an arc of the London Restoration. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. I so sometimes we get hooked up. That's, that's one of the best <laughs> perks about being an author, like getting early books sometimes or free books sometimes. <laughs> one of the best um, perks. So. And I also use NetGalley quite a bit. Um, mm. So, and that is open to anyone who is a book blogger or shares on Instagram or Twitter. Um, I've been on NetGalley for about 10 years. And because I share and, you know, as I call it, book gushing, because I gush about the books I love, often I get, you know, digital e-copies because of that. And that's, that's just really cool. And not just an author perk, that's a perk for readers. So if you start promoting other people's books and read a lot, authors love that we need people especially in the age of zoom calls and you know bookstores in toronto are still closed oh, everything in toronto is closed <laughs> but when bookstores were closed you know this is how we get the word out about our books so that's a really interesting way to but yes i i usually demand and beg <laughs> <laughs> so sarah wants to know were there specific books or series that inspired you to become authors? Um, I would say all of us have to have some. Um, Mary Stewart, I just adore. Her romantic suspense um, was a big influence. Um, let's see. I mean, just the books that like are in the genre I love. I mean, like, because they always say read what you want to, I mean, read broadly, but if you want to write something specific, read what you want to write, you know, so a lot of the people in my genre, you know, were inspirations and um, I don't know. What about you ladies? I, uh, I always read mysteries as long as I can remember since I was little, little, like I started out reading, um, there was these books I like, or like Encyclopedia Brown, there were these books called Cam Jansen and she had a photographic memory. And so like, she'd see something, she'd say click and then she'd review it in her head later and solve the mystery. And then like all the babysitters club, like super, oh, yeah, yeah. super, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the mystery editions and um, Nancy Drew, all that stuff. So I think that's just a genre that I've always, like for some reason, that, that's always what I've been drawn to. So I said, whenever, when I started writing stories for myself and stuff people often ended up getting murdered in them so <laughs> that's kind of like how I went along that path <laughs> I started out trying to write historical romance but I kept having murders and things yeah. happen <laughs> so I was like okay I think I need to write historical mystery and have romance be the subplot so <laughs> I started writing, I mean, my first traditional books are the Herringford and Watts series, of which there are six of them, and they're historical mysteries, but I always wanted to just be historical romance, so it's very funny, because the romance would just, like, take over. Um, <laughs> there is a, um, a book I signed at, when I was 10 years old, I signed at a book from our church library called Vienna Prelude by Bodhi Tani, and mm. it is a Christian historical romance set in Vienna just in the years preluding uh, World War II. And it's an American reporter who falls in love with a violinist in Vienna. And Vienna at that moment 
in grade or not grade 10 in when I was 10 years old, like I was young, little Rachel. Um, <laughs> I knew that, like Vienna was my Avonlea or my Narnia. Mm -hmm. I just, and then I was like, oh, I want to write books. I now love classical music somehow. <laughs> like all of yeah. my animal interests stem from that reading experience. That's amazing. I read cool. it every year. And so Vienna became like my muse and my canvas. And I always loved European set history. And I was like, wow, I need to read more books that are historical fiction. And then I just became obsessed. And so um, every time someone reads, you know, one of my three quarter time series, I always put like a little Easter egg from Vienna Prelude in there. And there's a few little moments in Mozart code where I do little, little Aww. That's so fun. This is That's a shout cool. out to that book because it was so influential. <laughs> you know, I love, I, I'm looking forward to the music aspect too, because I mean, I was a music major, so I'm like all about the, <laughs> the music stuff. So one of these days, because I keep getting asked this, I'm going to do some kind of music. Thing. Oh, you I mean, have to. I have to. Oh, that I mean, would be amazing. Like the book I'm writing right now, the Lady Darby book 10, which is out next year, it's all art. Like, cause yeah, yeah, I can't go into too much of it, but for Lady Darby too, because she has that amazing skill set. You know, for readers who don't know, Lady Darby started by her husband, her first husband, the non-gauge one. The bad. <laughs> um, he would make her draw the cadavers that he studied, so she has a very delicate touch. And oh my gosh, there's a scene in the first book. I guess we're gonna get to in book club. <laughs> you know, Gage and Lady Darby, and the yeah. Clearly, clearly I like these books. <laughs> yeah, she's a portrait artist. So like, I've been wanting to do something with more, with, with art more featured. So anyway, the next book, it's a big part of it. So I, I did, I geeked out and did a ton of research about art history stuff. And anyway, so, which I'm all into. So <laughs> it was fun. I always say that, you know, my parents, there's music in every one of my books. And that's because my parents spent so many <laughs> dollars uh paying for classical voice lessons since I was a little kid so you know in theory and piano and all of that so now I just kind of repurpose it into book form <laughs> ever wasted for a writer <laughs> yes yes that's true so I wanted to ask you guys because we've never actually talked about this um like where were you guys born I mean like where did you guys grow up do you have siblings. I mean, like, I don't know anything about y'all, your early lives. I was just curious about that. I mean, you grew up in Canada, right? Outside of Toronto? Yeah. So about Rachel? two hours north of Toronto. Um, not where I was born, but you know, where, what I call my hometown because I right. spent the bulk of my, um, yeah, my, my dad, he's now a chaplain for the Mounties in his retirement, but that's he amazing. Um, my mom's an elementary school French teacher before retirement. I have an older brother, um, who's currently in Ireland because he married um, an Irish woman. So he spends half wow. the year there and he's a doctor. So he's currently Ooh. trapped over there because of the plague. Um, mm. <laughs> but through him, I have three, uh, Maisie, Ellie, and Kieran are my two nieces and little nephew. Aww. I have a younger sister who lives about an hour away from Toronto. So she actually just did a porch drop off last week and her husband's a pilot who's starting to fly again. After oh, wow. That. So that was cool. Um, wow. Yeah, uh, totally Canadian, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> a, um, but always just wanted to grow up and just travel and read books. So the reading thing I've got going on, the traveling is just momentarily halted. <laughs> <laughs> you had so a kind much. of a bookish you had kind of a bookish job before earlier, didn't you? I, I mean... worked in educational publishing for 12 years. So I worked with textbooks. Um oh. universities. I would travel to universities and colleges across Canada and be like, yay, buy these books. Um so nowadays I I write in more than one genre, uh, but I'm also a literary agent. So I have some clients and sell their books and basically just books all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ashley? Where did you grow up? Did you grow up in Louisiana? Uh, no, I was, I was actually born in Texas. I lived there until I was about four and then we moved up north. 
And so I grew up mostly in Wisconsin. So that's kind of oh, where I consider my home. Really? Yeah. So I'm, uh, I didn't know that. Go Packers. I'm a cheese head. <laughs> <laughs> you did not know that. You need to read Amy Reichert's new one called, um, Kindred Spirit Supper Club. It comes out tomorrow and it's okay. in Wisconsin. It has an adorable hero. It's contemporary romance slash women's fiction. And it's basically if, um, Blythe Spirit met like it's got this supernatural thing what was it called uh kindred spirits supper club okay and it's i'll check it out once it is a love letter to wisconsin there is so much cheese there's so much (laughs) we do have really good cheese you do (laughs) yeah so uh um i moved to louisiana in 2005 so i've been here about 15 years now and so um you have a sister uh, right I do. I have a, a younger sister and a younger brother. Um, my sister has a uh, my five-year-old niece, and she's expecting a little boy in August. Aww. So we're so excited. Auntie so excited. So I can't wait to have another little tiny baby. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a librarian, too. I am. I'm a full-time librarian. I um, work for the Allen Parish Libraries here. I do kind of uh, technical services is what I'm really in, like cataloging and ordering books and that kind of thing but I do a lot of we're smaller library so kind of jack of all trades different different things I do so it's really fun to kind of get my fingers in all the pies (laughs) that's cool that's cool (laughs) do you feel better prepared for research when you were being a librarian I mean (laughs) yes I feel like I it it has helped a lot with you know especially you know getting my hands on the things I need I know how to look and where to look and the little tricks for finding those little bits of information and so yeah it's definitely been helpful I think all that good stuff and you have two (laughs) adorable daughters because (laughs) yes I do (laughs) yeah I so I grew up um, over the border I I currently live in Indiana but I grew up in um, Ohio in the northwest corner very rural um small town and I have um six well, I have five siblings. Wow. <laughs> I have four brothers and one sister. Um, and my sister is 13 years younger than me. So it was mostly me and boys. Right. <laughs> so, which is funny because I keep giving my, my heroine sisters. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah. So yeah, the, the, the sister brother thing I got down. <laughs> um, and, and it's funny too, because my husband has four brothers. So I have eight, brothers now wow. <laughs> so, um yeah and uh lots of lots of nieces and nephews because we have big families um and you know uh yeah I grew up there and then my dad got transferred to South Carolina when I was um 16 almost 17 which was a huge um impact huge impact in my life because I'd grown up in this little town where I knew everybody my whole life and um, there was like 70 kids in my class. And so, you know, I mean, very small. And then we moved to this, we moved and it was totally culture shock, totally different. And there was like 600 kids in my class. So it was just very different. Um, so, I mean, it definitely had a huge impact on me. And, uh, you know, then I went to college in Nashville, Tennessee, and that's where I met my husband. Um, and we lived there for a while and then moved back up North, but, um, yeah. So, and I mean, I was a music major in college and then I had some other random other jobs <laughs> trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. And then um, while I was doing that, I stumbled back into writing and then kind of just realized this is what I want to do. And until I was able to support myself like with it or we were then. Uh, yeah. So the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And you, um, I, you're, when you go to Vienna, readers, you see the name Huber everywhere. So um, in honor of Anna, I wrote um, a hero in Christmas in three-quarter time, my dashing Austrian hero in that. His surname is Huber for Anna. Because <laughs> you go there, so Huber on all the buildings. There is, it's, I, I think in Austria, Germany, it's like the, one of the top 10 surnames. Oh, I mean, it's, everywhere. it's just huge. Over there. And there's tons of Anna Hubers, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> my name is not, my name is very common over there. <laughs> but how did you come by Lady Darby? Because I know that you, like, 
I know that you love um, Mary Stewart and obviously Susanna Kearsley. And there's definitely those moments within the Lady Darby books, but you've written books that are a little bit more non, you know, that they're, they're set in older time periods. There's a mystical type thing to them. Um, is the love of Scotland and that mythos are always been a passion of yours? How did you stumble upon that? Yeah, I don't know. It, you know, it's so funny. I, I'm fascinated by Britain in general, but Scotland in particular, I don't know why it just has always appealed to me. And I keep trying to think like where initially did I get that from? I have no idea. I must've read some things and I don't know. I mean, um, it just has. And like, the more I read about it, the more I kept reading about it. And like when we traveled there, you know, like I talk about how when you, there's, there's something about sometimes when you go to a place and you just like, feel like you've been there before. It's like yeah. almost like a, like a, like a genealogical memory. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I don't yeah. know how to explain it otherwise. That's what I felt when I went to Ireland. I was like, yeah. I feel like I belong here. <laughs> yeah. When I went to the Highlands, I was just like, I mean, like the smell of the air and like, it just felt like I've been here, you know, and it just felt like comfortable. And, um, I don't know. And it's funny because so my, my maiden name is very, is very German Austrian. And my mother's maiden name is German. And I mean, there's all this Germans in my family and we live in an area where it was settled by Germans, you know? So, um, I thought, okay, when I, I'm going to do my DNA and it's going to come back like 90% German. Okay. <laughs> but it didn't. My, most of my, my predominant DNA is from Britain is from England, um, Scotland, and then some Ireland, and then Scandinavia, and then Germany. And so I just thought that was crazy because that's awesome. I'm writing yeah. about what's in my DNA, apparently, you know. So, <laughs> so we have some kind of ancestors. I did know of one Scottish one, and funnily enough, well, I did this on purpose. Um, he was a Kincaid, so <laughs> that's why I made Bonnie Rock a Kincaid because I know I have Kincaid ancestors. So <laughs> that's so fun. Yeah. I, fun, I, fun. I, Ashley, I want to read you right. Uh, I want, this is going to be a bad sentence. I can just sense it, but I want to read you write Ireland someday there. Oh yeah. I would love to <laughs> do that. Write books that there someday. I would love to definitely. I went, I went to uh, 2019 actually. So that was like actually my last big trip before all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was just, it was amazing. I was like, Oh, I just feel like I could just hop right in and live here it's so beautiful <laughs> and amazing so yeah definitely inspirational so it, I'm sure it'll pop up sometime that'd be cool that'd be cool yeah it's a beautiful place I always tell my brother you know he's a doctor there and so he often right now drives to visit patients and so I in my mind I'm just like okay Jared but like say you get there and there's no vet around and it's an injured sheep. I just, I've made up this all yeah. great and small job for him. And he's like, Rachel, that's not how things go. And I'm like, do not tell me that. You yeah. Know, you're bad. <laughs> he can have his own BBC show. And you're <laughs> saving sheep in Ireland during COVID. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so any more questions, go ahead and get them in. Cause we're going to wrap up here in a minute. Um, but yeah, we can keep talking for a minute. I'm just, I'm trying to check and make sure I haven't missed anything. <laughs> but definitely we need to read these comments afterwards because there's a bunch of people making comments. So I think we that need to so do fun. one of these for Ashley's release too. I think we should like loop back <laughs> May and peculiar combination it up. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, trying to think I, I had written all these questions and we're just talking and that's fine that's yeah always, that's always so been, fine. it always makes better conversation anyway when does the new verity come out i've read it i'm a jerk i'm sorry but when does it go for the general non -jerk? it comes out it's august, august 31st august. <laughs> it's so good and so let me recap at least on this so ashley weavers um a pe peculiar combination i don't know why i keep stumbling over that um, comes out may 25th and Rachel's, um, the Mozart Code, comes out January 18th of 2022, yeah. which you can check out London Restoration now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Definitely. yeah, so my uh, Wicked Conceit just came out um, 
two weeks ago. Yeah. My cover is amazing. Oh, thanks. I love it. I love it. And all um, your covers are amazing. <laughs> my, like, I, I can't even take credit. My publisher Lady are... Derby on the cover. Can you imagine what are the beautiful dresses she's always wearing with the every time one of your covers pops up? I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> they're really good. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, the cover so, is really good too. The London Restoration cover and the Mozart Code cover are oh, both Oh, I know. Beautiful. The Mozart Code, so code one I'm drooling so over. It's the one I'm gorgeous. writing now is actually a retelling of the Scarlet Pimpernel. Yes, I'm so excited for that. Parents. I don't know what they're going to do with the cover or the title. Like in my head and on the page, it's called Pimpernel Book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> an actual title. But yeah, they've done an amazing job on those covers. I just kind of sit and salivate. They're gorgeous. Yeah. Just, yeah. Cover. We've had. We've been very lucky with cover art. I got to say that. I have. I have we have friends who have horror stories. I have, yeah, I have seen I mean, horror. I have never had a bad cover. Like I've liked them all. And you know, sometimes in my a little uh, bookish aside here, sometimes in my agent role, it's part of my job as an agent. If a client gets cover art they don't feel represents the book, then I'm kind of the liaison. And often, cover art is determined a lot by the sales team too, because they want the cover mm -hmm. that is going to drive the book. So it's a really precarious balance between reflecting the story, but also like what's going to be eye catching. Like for London Restoration, I wanted St. Paul's, but then I was like, Rachel, you can just Google St. Paul's. The general reading public does not mean it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh church is everywhere and then but like, I definitely feel like if I saw either of your cover you know I, I know I don't generally judge a book by its cover but that is the first thing that catches your eye and it is true. either of yeah. your covers would be something that if I was walking past a shop I would gravitate to look at so and even the Amory and Milo covers are amazing too they've done a really awesome job on those too every time I, I, I every time they uh you know email me one I'm like, oh it's so good <laughs> Really I mean, they know what they're that. doing. They do. It's like a, there's an art to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, there are hiccups sometimes, but in general, they really know what they're doing. I mean, way more than, I mean, and there's an art to everything, even the covers, you know, it's like, it's got to have this kind of wording and you know what I mean? Like they yeah. know what grabs people's attention or like, right. it, you know, it says that it's this kind of the book and not this kind of book. You know, everything like that. And the even to the that, hours. The one that you came out last year where you were in a compilation with some other writers, C.S. Harris and Susanna Kearsley and so on, like that, just the, the little watch. Like that was, I know, it's so gorgeous. I with love the that. Mermaid scale background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been lucky. So <laughs> we've all been lucky. Yes. <laughs> Well, I think we are, we don't have any more questions. I hope I didn't miss any. If we did, then I'm sorry. And maybe we'll catch it when we come back and re read through comments. So, but um, I want to thank Ashley and Rachel for joining me. And I want to thank all of you guys for joining us. Um, this was a lot of fun and we will definitely do it again because it's just fun. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so um, we'll wish you all a good night and happy reading. <laughs>